This recording is to accompany our discussion of Rule 4 in class, and so what we're going to do is use a few strategies to reading statutes to cover the material in 4K1, and then we'll walk you up to 4K2, which is what we're going to spend more time on cla in class on. Um, and I want you to focus on how to read these statutes and also understand that the material in this video in 4K1 is testable um, and there's just some interesting quirks to federal courts personal jurisdiction. So if you look at 4K1 as a statute, the whole thing starts off with one which says serving a summons or filing a waiver of service establishes personal jurisdiction over a defendant. So we're going to spend time later in class learning about in a different unit about how you serve someone and filing waivers of service and what how you do that under the rules under rule 4 but for now just presume that that activity which is governed in a different section of rule 4 will actually grant personal jurisdiction in the federal courts if you f fit one of the following subsections A through C so each one of A through C has the premise of serving a summons or filing a waiver of service on the defendant okay so for A we already talked about this at one point before when we started personal jurisdiction it gives PJ over a defendant who is subject to the jurisdiction of a court of general jurisdiction in the state where the district court is located. So if you look at the relevant provisions here, when do federal courts have PJ over a defendant? It's when you serve the defendant, basically anywhere where Rule 4 tells us you can serve them. That's the way a lawsuit is initi initiated under the federal rules of, of civil procedure. Once you do that, and the defendant is subject to personal jurisdiction in a court of general jurisdiction. So basically those are state courts. So subject to jurisdiction in a state court in which the district court sits. So in other words, as long as you fit the state court rules or the state rules for PJ, the district courts in that state will also have PJ over the defendants. It's why essentially we've always linked a federal and state discussion of personal jurisdiction. So for example, if you wanted to exercise PJ over someone in the Southern District of Ohio under 4K1A, you'd serve them anywhere permitted under the rules of service. And then when the Ohio long arm statute and exercise of jurisdiction would be constitutional under international shoe, you would have PJ over that defendant in the Ohio federal courts. See the basic rules for PJ for the Ohio um, state courts, these two, fitting the long arm and being constitutional, plus the fact that there was uh, appropriate service, and that would constitute PJ in the federal courts. Um, here, we want to just take a moment and pause to distinguish between this kind of PJ based on service and the type of PJ based on service we see in Burnham. In Burnham, the service was used itself to accomplish personal jurisdiction. The difference here is that um, you can accomplish service anywhere. It doesn't have to actually happen in the state as long as it's sufficient under the rules of civil procedure for service. It doesn't matter that um, it's just saying service has to happen. For Burnham, in order for the service itself to constitute personal jurisdiction, that had to happen in the state itself. So here's the contrast. If you wanted to fit tag jurisdiction for Burnham, you would have had to serve a defendant in the state of Ohio in order for you to find tag jurisdiction for any of the courts in Ohio, whether they be state courts or federal courts. For Rule 4K1A, it just says you need to serve them anywhere. We could serve them if it's appropriate under the rules of service in Indiana. And as long as we've served them and they are subject to the personal jurisdiction rules of the state of Ohio, then that service in Indiana is fine to, to count as the trigger for 4K1A. Okay, so see the difference. Burnham is about the territorial aspects of the state and finding the person as a transient in the state, basically walking through, you tag them there because the service happens in the state, tag we found you, you get PJ over that defendant. This kind of service is just uh, the formality to trigger the rule that they've actually been served a summons. So it can happen anywhere in the country. And then, assuming you have, then of course, the Ohio long arm statute met and that PJ was constitutional, you would have uh, 
found PJ over the defendant under rule 4K1A. All right, so 4K1B is a different type of rule if we look at it. It's the same trigger under 4K1, but B says you're talking about defendants who are a party joined under Rule 14 or 19 and is served within a judicial district of the United States and not more than 100 miles from where the summons was issued. All right, so if we break it down, the first part of the rule dictates who this rule applies to. Um, it says who is a party joined under Rule 14 or 19. So what defendants are we talking about? Those defendants that are joined as third parties under Rule 14 so basically people who've been implied because they are found contributorily negligent or they had a contract to indemnify another or parties joined as necessary parties under Rule 19. And as I mentioned before, whenever there's a reference to the rules of civil procedure, I will actually give you the rule number in this class. Um, but you will learn uh, those rules if you haven't already in your rules section of civil procedure so you'll understand them both under terms like contribution and necessary party as well as under the rule number but I will give you the rule number okay so first of all find a defendant who's been joined as a party under rule 14 or 19 okay and then we have to figure out the second part of the sentence they are served with a new judicial district of the United States and not more than a hundred miles from where the summons was issued. So what you're seeing here as I'm walking through the statute is a deliberate use of the uh, breaking up the terms into, su into sub clauses. So we took out part this first part of one we keep talking about service summons or filing a waiver of service establishes PJ the second part for B, what we did was break up the who it applies to. Once we saw the word and here and can look, skim through the rest of it, we see a separate clause. There's in fact another one sort of within it, the and not more than 100 miles, if you wanted to break it up into three separate groups. Um, but this is what I want you to do with each statute. Break it down so that you can figure out the subparts and see what applies. All right, so what does this red section here refer to? Well, um, it refers to what you have to do to actually exercise PJ over the defendant, and that is serve them within a hundred miles of the court that issued the summons. So what is that? Well, the summons is the accompanying document once you file the complaint, you know, to bring someone into court, the summons from the court. So basically, if you file in the federal court in the Southern District of Ohio, then it's that court that we're focusing on, and you need to find them 100 miles from that court. Um, and so you might be asking yourself, why would you want to do this? Um, I mean, of course, you could always sue someone um, in a state like Ohio, 100 miles from where the court is and still be in the state of Ohio. How is that any different from Burnham? How is that any different from 4K1A? Well, here's the trick. Since it's located, or it's based on distance, mileage, what you're really looking at for this is someone who's getting served just outside the state's boundaries, all right, but they're still within 100 miles of the court that issues the summons. Um, and so this kind of form of PJ actually has a very quirky little name to it but you'll hear it in courts it's called bulge jurisdiction so you're like within this bulge around the court area so you're just outside the state so how is it similar or how is it different from Burnham remember the tag jurisdiction that's happening in Burnham has to occur within the state itself so if you wanted PJ based on Burnham it has to happen in Ohio. If you want PJ under the bulge rule, the tag, the contact, the service itself can occur outside the actual state's boundaries but within a hundred miles of the court. All right, so it gives you a little plus across state lines that you get within federal courts. All right, and this actually is really important in states where the, they're very close together, like New York, New Jersey, or you're across state lines very quickly where the um, uh, you might find people. Out west where there's a lot of space you tend not to use this as much but it is an interesting little um, add-on to have. Okay one other piece before we go through a hypothetical about it we've always talked about constitutionality in 4k1a the constitutionality came in because you had to comply with the state rules for PJ and we always know it's fit the long arm plus international shoe. So do we have to worry about constitutionality if we use this special little bulge rule? 
Of course we do. It's the Constitution. It's going to apply no matter what statute we use. So in this situation, we just use a kind of modified version of it. We still use the same minimum contacts test we would use under international shoe, minimum contacts, plus fair play, substantial justice. But we're only looking at the contacts that happen to occur within that bulge area. So you'd have to actually find that they'd meet international shoe within that 100 mile range. So it really does limit this bulge application. Assuming I can find this person 100 miles outside of the state, to tag them and still get it to go back to the state from which it issued the summons. That's why it's not Burnham. I'm trying to sue you in Ohio, but I serve you while you're in Kentucky, or I serve you while you're in Indiana, 100 miles from the border of Ohio. So Burnham says that's not good enough because it doesn't happen in Ohio. This says it's okay. However, I still have to find minimum context within that 100 mile area. So if you're a domiciliary of Ohio, I might as well just serve you in Ohio. This gives me nothing extra. What this is, is finding someone who really has planted just outside the state lines within that 100 mile area, and they have so many contacts there that it would be um, uh, constitutional to exercise jurisdiction over them for general purposes or the activity which happened to be the basis for the suit like the specific jurisdiction basis occurred within that hundred mile area so it's actually fairly limited in its application and why it only really occurs in states that are very close together because you not only have to find them within the hundred miles that whole region has to be um, constitutional and if they were otherwise constitutional in your state you don't need to reach out to this hundred mile rule you would just have no need for it so here's an example of when you might use it. Say A lives in New York City, New York, but has her car serviced at B's garage across the river in New Jersey. A gets into a car accident with C in Ohio. C sues A in a federal district court in New York City, and this is the first claim we have here, negligence. A impleads, and so if you think about it, C from Ohio sues A from New York, and sues A in her domiciliary in New York. She's got no PJ challenge. But she really wants to bring B into the suit, and the court still has to have personal jurisdiction over this defendant as well. She impleads B under Rule 14. New York's long arm statute doesn't cover B, so you technically could not fit um, 4K1A, right? Because this isn't a defendant when you have service of summons based on the interpleader action who would fit under the New York rules because they don't fit under the New York long arm. Can we still exercise PJ over B? And the answer is yes. Uh, the bulge rule will permit the service to count even though it's not covered by the long arm statute. Um, and will count towards personal jurisdiction. It doesn't count under Burnham because he's going to get tagged in New Jersey. If we happen to find B across the state lines in New York City and tag them in New York, then of course we have Burnham and don't need to worry about the bulge rule. But let's assume he's not there, so we only tag him in New Jersey. Burnham doesn't help us either. So now uh, we have to look to the contacts within that area, within the bulge area, and say whether or not that meets international shoe. And if he sets up his camp there, and that's actually where the garage performed the work I'm going to say is subpar, um, or A is going to say is subpar, then that would meet at least specific jurisdiction. If not, potentially, if his domicile is there, also general jurisdiction. And that means that the district court could exercise PJ over B under 4K1B, with the constitutionality being within the bulge rule. Right, this is the last issue before we get to 4K2, and that's the one I'm going to leave for class. Okay, 4K1C basically says if you serve someone and it's authorized by PJ under the federal statute under which they're being served, you can have PJ over the person. This is a very, very narrow um, subset of the rules. It permits federal, the federal statute uh, you're looking at is permitting nationwide service of process. And there's several that actually do this. Bankruptcy code does this. Security regulations do this. And so the Congress is basically saying once we've provided for this form of nationwide service of process, and you want to look at it just like that within the statute, what they are basically telling us is that it counts like it's being tagged, this defendant's being tagged anywhere and letting it count as sufficient to exercise PJ. So um, uh, the other issue with this though is are we still concerned about constitutionality and hopefully you say yes because the Constitution applies to everything and so the issue here now is it's a different kind of constitutional limit. You're not under the 14th Amendment because we're not looking at any state 
uh, we're looking at the Fifth Amendment. Uh, so we're going to use the international shoe test and we're going to use the defendant's contacts with the entire United States as our focus point. So instead of like in our traditional uh, PJ cases we've think, thought about so far, when you say, oh, the forum's Ohio, what are the contacts in Ohio? 4K1C says you've gotten tagged under this nationwide service of process. So we're going to look at constitutionality as your contacts with the country as a whole and say, based on all these contacts across the United States, is there minimum contacts and fair play substantial justice to meet international shoe if we consider the forum to be the entire United States? So typically for these individuals, it opens up a lot of opportunities because you get account together contacts from a variety of states. Um, plus it also helps with foreign nationals um, who might have contacts sporadically across the country, but nothing in depth in any one state in which you could actually use that for tag jurisdiction. All right, so that's the basics of this video. We're walking up to 4K2. What I want you to do, here's 4K2, list out and think about the requirements. Walk through the statute, excerpting each section of the statute. You have a new opener here. It's different than 4K1. And you've got two subparts. All of these work in tandem to create 4K2. It's a little tricky, but an important small sliver left that the federal courts have to exercise PJ and we're going to focus on those in class together.